the, the title of the message today, or what I'm going to preach on, is we're actually going to be focusing on Psalm 1. And uh, I'm actually going to go through the entire chapter. It's a short chapter, and uh, I'm going to take the, uh, we're going to just break down the entire, uh, almost word by word. Uh, and I'm not going to go through every single word, but we're almost going to go through every single word and almost every single, I mean, definitely every single verse. But uh, the point of this message is that, number one, it's just kind of been popping up in my Bible reading and in my studying as I've been going back and forth. I've been in Psalm 1 quite a bit. And number two is it just it stands out as we begin the year earlier. You know, this week I preached on being weaned off the spiritual milk in certain areas of our life. You know, we might have meat in one section of our life versus another, or we have milk. But another thing that just uh, stands out about this verse is just how powerful and what uh, what a punch it packs. And so we're just going to go through this verse by verse and see how much, uh, how important it is to walk uh, righteously, how important it is to continue to grow and leave the sins of our lives in the past and, uh, you know, continue to just focus on working less, I mean, uh, continue to focus on improving our walk with the Lord. Now, we're always sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That, that's a fact. But one of the things that we need to focus on is we need to focus on uh, being in the Word so that we can avoid the temptations and we can overcome our sins quicker. And, and the reason that I'm preaching this is, uh, you know, number one, that really was the message. And, and you know, I heard a, uh, a good pastor a couple years ago. I don't remember where I heard it. But, you know, you don't change the message uh, for anybody that's coming in or that's in the audience, and, and you don't uh, adjust the message. You just preach the message that the Lord has laid in your heart. And uh, this message has been on my heart now for a couple of days. But then on top of that, you know, amongst uh, several churches that are friends to uh, us and, and that, um, that uh, we, we, we fellowship with, they've, they've had issues uh, specifically with uh, leadership stepping down and other individuals trying to uh, usurp authority and one of the things that uh, I think happens is that we don't take some of the words of the Lord to heart and then we don't know how to respond in situations and we end up reacting and you know we have to be able to let our nay be nay and our yay be yay and at times even when we make the tough decisions uh, we, we, we might be in our flesh not certain of the decisions but one thing is for sure if we walk in the Lord, if we stand in the Lord, if we sit and meditate on His Word, we're definitely going to be in His will, and He'll take care of the things that we're, we're just not aware of. You know, uh, greater is He that is in us that is in the world. So if He's in us and He's working through us, then obviously anything that we uh, fall short on, He will rectify. And uh, we have to have confidence in that, but only if we're in the Word. If we're not, we're... we're uh, then we're leading ourselves by our own counsel. So go ahead and just turn, and, and let's, let's focus on this. Let's, let's look at verse 1. Uh, you turn into, uh, go ahead and turn there in Deuteronomy uh, 30. Deut turn to Deuteronomy 30. And let's just take a look and let's break this down. It says, Blessed is the man, or blessed is the man, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And so the first thing we see here is that it, we walk. It's an action verb, right? We're walking in the council. So there's two things here that stand out. Because, you know, we're going to close out on a positive note, right? We're going to close out on what the consequence of not doing these things uh, is. But the first thing it's saying is, look, there's either you're either walking with Christ, you're walking with the Word, with fellowship with other believers, or you're walking uh, in the council of the ungodly. So let's look at that. Let's look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. It says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And blessing is just something, it's a, pro, a prosperity, it's happiness, it's, uh, you know, good results from the things that we, the decisions we're making and living for Christ. Now, when I mean good results, well, Bible tells us we're going to have trials and tribulations and things that we're going to have to deal with. But the one thing that's certain is that when we're walking in God's ways, He's going uh, to—he's going to bestow upon us His blessing, His biblical blessing, and that's a very important thing because unfortunately, sometimes you get a lot of false doctrine that says, "Look, if you do—if you do A, you're going to get B, 
And the Bible says that if you know he's going to give you of his riches, so there's no problem in you working hard and stepping over people and being a scam artist. As long as you know you're in the work, and that's why you deserve that big house and the two cars and and all the opulence of the world. But the Bible's, you know, if we read it in its context, that's not really what this is saying. It says, "Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly." So let's go there. It says, "I have called heaven and earth to record this day in Deuteronomy 30:19 against you that I have set before you life and death." blessing and cursing therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live so we see there life is tied to blessings and death is tied to the cursings it says that thou mayest love the lord thy god and that thou mayest obey his voice so we have to love the lord obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. And you know, it's interesting because we're talking here, this is Deuteronomy, and he's talking to uh, the people where Moses is leading them through the desert, and they're preparing to go into the promised land. He's talking about uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, you know, if you're just reading this in its context, this promise is specifically to that time. But also, if we read it in the context of the Bible, this promise is also to us for eternity. Because the Bible says, if you turn there to Mark 12, 26, and then I'll also read for you Luke 20. And then from Mark, we're going to be in Proverbs 1, 8. But in Mark 12, 26, he says, And it's touching the dead uh, that they rise. Have ye not read in that book of Moses... So this is when he's talking to Moses in Deuteronomy, how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. And of course, this is when he's talking to the Pharisees, and they're trying to, uh, uh, you know, get him on the fact that, you know, what if this guy married this woman? You know, that's a, a, a parable of you know, who is, she, who is this woman married to of all the brothers when they go to heaven? And he corrects them. But the one thing that stands out here is the thing I want to focus on. He says, look, I am not the God. Uh, he says, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And so we see that this life is not just the life now, but it's also the eternal life. But there's something to be said about having a blessed life here on earth. You know, life is tough as it is. There's going to be challenges, you know, and we just started the year and already challenges are upon us, you know, in, in your life, in your congregation and the people that you surround with yourself with. You're going to have uh, trials. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to have fiery trials. But the Bible says that, look, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, turn to Proverbs 8 while, I'm, while I read for you. Uh, I mean, Proverbs 1 while I read for you Luke 20. Because it's just another uh, verse that backs that up. And in Luke 20, we see the same uh, story being told. And it says, Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. And just on a real quick side note, if you ever run into Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists believe in soul sleep. And so there's a lot of false religions out there that believe in soul sleep. And one of the things that you can do is you can take them to Mark 12 or Luke 20 and just remind them that God is the God of the living. So when he says that this is that he is the God of the living, it's because he's speaking of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, who are alive in heaven with him now for all eternity. You know, they their death is only in the physical body, the corruptible body, but their spirit is incorruptible. It's in heaven one day to be rejoined with the incorruptible uh, body. But anyways, I mean, that's just a side note. But turn there to Proverbs 1, and we're going to start in verse 8. So we see that the first part of this is there's a blessing for this action. Blessed is the man that walketh. So let's look at what the, the Lord says about walking with him. It says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. And he's given them instructions, and it's not just that we need to listen to the word of God. I mean, obviously, our final authority on all matters of uh, faith, you know, in our walk is the word of uh, the word of the Lord. But when you're younger, when you're a child, you know, you might not grow up in a in a in a Christian church, but or with Christian parents or godly parents or going to church regularly. At least that was my experience 
we even when we were Seventh Day Adventists, we would uh, you know go to church sporadically. But the one thing that we learned was that we had to obey our parents. Now my parents were really strict, and so we got a lot of whoopings and we got a lot of uh, you know uh, groundings and you know punishments for certain things. But the Bible says here, he, he's reminding those of you who are in the word those of you who are growing up in church that it's not just enough to listen to the word of god you have to listen to your parents this is my son hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck my son if sinners entice thee consent thou not let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down in the pit and you know the pit is another word for hell right we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our house with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Among us, Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in, thy, in the sight of any ver bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. And this is talking about who you're walking with. So the first thing we notice is we're walking with someone. See, we can't walk with God if we're walking with the world. We can't walk with godly men if we're seeking, if we're walking and taking counsel from ungodly individuals. Here he's saying uh, in the word, says, if they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, then what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for failure and you're setting others up for failure. It says, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as to those that go down in the pit. And the ultimate consequence is if you're not saved, is number one, if you're saved and you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, you are being a stumbling block for those that could potentially be saved. You know, because your duty is to preach the whole counsel of God. But if you're getting the wrong counsel, how can you do that? But number two is if, if someone's listening to this and they're not saved and you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, eventually the consequence at the end of your life, this physical life, will be an eternal hell. Now we're going to close out and talk a little bit about you know, salvation, but this message is for those of us who are here, who are saved, who are uh, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, blessed is the man that walketh not. Walketh is that action, right? Walking, that means you have to actively take a side. You're taking a stance. We're going to see that, and you're, you're going you're, you're gonna to pick a side. And what side are you picking? Ultimately, you're picking the side of God. You're picking the side of, of, of the Word of God, of Jesus Christ. And at times, you know, people are going to let you down. And friends and family are going to desert you, but you know who will never desert you? The Lord Jesus Christ. Turn in Proverbs 2, uh, verse 1. And real quick, just I don't want to forget. Uh, I remember my mom. It's interesting how the world, even without God, understands certain natural laws. I remember my mom, and I'm going to say it in Spanish and then and I'll say it in English, but she would always say, Mejor, mejor que digan que aquí corrió, que aquí quedó. Meaning, it's better... If they said here that here laid this guy, then it's better to that I'm translating this and I'm trying to make it literal, but let me just translate it the way it should be. That she would always say when someone was trying to pick a fight or you know if we're going to be in trouble, it's better if someone says that you ran and you look like a coward than here he lay dead. And what she was talking about is you know sometimes these things can escalate and don't get into arguments just for argument's sake. You know, learn to pick your battles and all this thing. And it's it you know it. You grow up, and I remember those little sayings. My mom just had a bunch of, you know, have you ever been with a, a Mexican mom? They just have saying after saying after saying. And, you know, they just, just drive them in your head. And I can hear them, my mom saying just all the time as I'm doing this. And then you read the Bible, and she, on some of the things that she taught me, she was right on, on the word of the Lord. It says here, look, if you're running with these groups, this is what's going to happen. They're looking for blood, and eventually your blood is going to be shed. Go to Proverbs 2. It says, my son... In verse 1, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, 
Yet, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest, liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler for them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. In other words, when you're walking in the Lord, he's making the paths and he's preserving the ways, right? Thou shalt thou, then, thou, then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity Yea, every good path. You understand why you're on that path. Sometimes in life, things don't make sense. But when you're in the God's way, it'll, it'll come to understanding. It says, when wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. So he's saying, look, there's a blessing for taking that stands and walking in my statutes. You know, um, and let's read verse 12 and, thir uh, 12 and 13 because I have them here. But discretion, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of upright, uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. So see, at, at the end of the day, it is black and white. There is a decision, a decision you have to make. You know, I, I, I've had many growing up in, in my Christian immaturity, you know, when I was younger, I had many arguments. You know, obviously the Bible says that we shouldn't you know, admonish a heretic once or twice and then you move on. But, you know, when you're younger, you just want to be in that battle. And, and sometimes you, you kind of get excited and you're, you're, you want to argue. And I've argued for hours with people. But at the end of the day, one of the arguments I would get a lot. And, you know, if I were to probably pursue those arguments even to, to this day is, well, you know, not everything in life is black and white. According to God, it is. Look, I mean, if you're not walking in his paths, it says, who leave the paths of uprightness in, in verse 13, it says, to walk in the ways of darkness. So you're either walking in the counsel of the ungodly or you're walking in the path of uprightness. I mean, it's either one or the other. There is no middle ground. There's no uh, path that leads, uh, you know, to this gray area where you, you kind of can be on one side and then you're on the other side. I remember a movie a long time ago. I'm not even going to mention it. I just remember the scene. You know, they were. it was supposed to be a comedy and there was a small creek. They're fighting over it. Long story short, I just remember that, you know, you're on one side, you're on the other side of the creek. You're on one side of the creek, you're on the other side of the creek. But what what stands out is that's that's how life is. You're either on one side of this path or this river bank or whatever, or you're on the other side. It really is a battle. That's why I think that for men... It makes sense that we like sports, you know, where there's one side and the other. We like war movies or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, good and evil. And, and, uh, and this is and, and what I mean by we as in when you're growing up, you know, I don't, I don't uh, promote or endorse or, uh, or encourage anybody to watch TV, period. You know, this is back in the day. But, you know, when you're growing up, that's what appeals to. To, to the man in you is that there's always a side and a battle that somebody, there's a righteous cause that you want to take up. Well, there's not a more righteous cause than to walk in the counsel of Jesus Christ. You know, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Turn there to Mark 7. In the meantime, I'll read for you. Uh, oh, you know what? Just turn to Mark 7. We're going to be in verse number 5. You know, we're going to talk a little bit more about walking and, and the blessing and cursing. In, in Mark 7, verse number 5, it says, Then the Pharisees and the scribe asked him, Why walk not thy, uh, not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? In other words, they're not just talking about walking like you're, out in the, you're outside strolling next to somebody. What they're saying is, the Pharisees and the scribe asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders? In other words, why are they not taking our side? Why are they not on our team? Why are they not taking our stance? Why are they not on our belief system? Why do they do not adhere to our doctrines? You know, as they said, tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands. And then they're fighting over something uh, idiotic, like the washing of hands. And what does Jesus do? He answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of, your, of you hypocrites, as it is written, 
This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrine, uh, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God. In other words, they just, they chose not to walk. They took aside, laying aside. They they ignored, laying aside the commandment of God. Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, For well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the earth. I mean, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So he's basically saying, look, because you're calling me out, because they're not on your team, but really your team's not the team that anybody needs to be on. And this is talking... Uh, you know, they're angry at him. He says, look, this is this profits nothing because you're changing the law. You're not even walking in my counsel. And let's go to Proverbs, uh, go to Proverbs 24, go back to Proverbs. I'm going to read for you in the meantime, Proverbs 11. It says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You know, there's something to be said about getting together with a, a group of fellow believers that know the word and then searching out how to make a proper decision based on God's word, right? Where no counsel is, the people fall. It says, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 24, verse 6, backs this up. He says, for by wise counsel, thou shalt make thy war. And in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. It's interesting that they use that term war. The Bible uses the term war. For by wise counsel, thou shalt make war. Because the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The safety is in the counsel of God. And then when you get to the point where maybe you don't, there's something that you don't know. And look, we don't know everything that we read in the Bible. We're going to grow and mature and we have more meat every day. But there's times where you might just not know how to approach something. Look, there's nothing wrong with seeking out counsel, but seek it out from people who are looking to the same, uh, the same set of rules for that counsel. It says, wisdom is too high for a fool. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. He that deviseth to do evil shall be called a mischievous person. The thought of foolishness is sin, and a and the scorner is an abomination to men. And it's and the other thing I want you to pay attention to is I'm using other words that are in Psalms one like sinners and scorners in all these verses because there's a lot of truth in Psalms one uh, or Psalm one. You know the the thing that we got to look at so. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel. Well, the counsel comes from God. Of the ungodly. Go to uh, Romans 5. In the meantime, I'll read to you uh, Proverbs 6 and Romans 4. But, uh, you know, just real quick. What does the word ungodly mean? Or, you know, I, a couple of weeks ago I did uh, uh, the a sermon called Unthankful. And I gave you the prefix un, meaning it's just the removal of. So ungodly would just be, the easiest would be to just say, you know, you, you're removing God from your life, right? Or you just have no knowledge of him. It says a wicked, impious, neglecting the fear and worship of God or violating his commands. Someone who's sinful, contrary to the divine commands, ungodly lead. And of course, when we sin, you know, we're, we're not walking in the spirit. But the one thing that we want to focus on is that, uh, you know, there's, we can be ungodly if we fall away, but then there's also ungodly people, right? Polluted by wickedness, as ungodly they. So if you look there, uh, I'm going to read for you Proverbs 16, 27 says, An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a fire burning. In other words, someone who's ungodly, or he's not walking in the counsel of God, well then he's looking for something. In other words, this indicates to me that man is always seeking a purpose. And if your purpose is not after the statutes and the word of God, then your purpose will deviate. And then you're going to redirect that purpose to something evil. It says, it diggeth up evil. Look, if you're going to dig something up, that means that you're actually premeditating. You're taking time to do something that is going to be evil. It says, and in his lips there is a burning fire. You're there in Romans 5, but 
you know, we I use this verse a lot when I'm out soul winning, uh, talking about, you know, it's not of works. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So yeah, I just want to make that clear because, you know, you look stuff up and you read and people try to twist the word of God. An ungodly person is still someone who Christ died for that Christ can save. But when you're not living godly, well, then you're living ungodly. I, for that, that's the reason I included those. I want to make, make that point clear. We're not talking about the reprobate doctrine today. We're not talking about those that are cast out, who God has given up. But we are talking about the fact that when we're not walking or standing or sitting in the council of God and we're doing things with uh, you know, the wrong people, we can end up in uh, some very bad situations. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand. We're going to talk about standing. You know, We're going to take a stand for something and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So how do you get patience through tribulation? And how do you get experience through patience? And how do you get hope through experience? And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given us. For when ye were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So, at some point, we've all been ungodly. The, the goal is that now that you're saved and you're growing in Christ is to walk not in the counsel of the ungodly so that you can become godly. But you can't do that if you're still in the same, you're still doing the same things that you were doing before or, or you're, you're backsliding, right? Let's go, uh, let's go to verse 2 of Psalm 1. Or I mean, uh, let's continue there. I'm sorry, in verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. So now he's talking about someone who's not only taking that side, they, they're going to walk with that person, but they're also going to take that stance. They're also going to, you know, anchor themselves on that belief system. He says, look, don't stand in the way of the sinner. Don't stand in the way of the, someone who transgressed in the law. And the other way that I look at it also is, look, if we're soul winning, because Psalm 1 ends on a soul winning note, is you don't want to stand or be uh, take such a, take such an anchoring on something dumb that will impede people from uh, the one way, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm looking at it two ways. You're taking a stance. You know, he standeth in the way of sinner. You take a stance in something you believe in. You're not going to, you're unmovable. And, and the idea is to be unmovable in Christ. But the other thing that I see is, you know, this is probably more of just uh, for the analogy, but you know, if someone's trying to get to Christ, you should be willing to move out of the way and let them to Christ, or you, you're part of that process, not you're in the way because of some stupid uh, counsel, or not listening to Christ, or not sitting in Christ, or not standing in His ways, or not meditating on His Word, you know, doing the things of Christ, and then all of a sudden, they, they reject Christ because of something that you said that wasn't right. And I'm not saying that you're going to get everything right in the Bible, but you know what? Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is something pretty simple. You, you, there's no way to mess that up once you get it right. You know, the only way to do that is if you start getting off on the beaten path. If you start walking in the counsel of the ungodly, you know, or standing in the way of sinners. But let's go there to, uh, go there to 2 Timothy 2. Go to there to 2 Timothy 2. Go there to 2 Timothy 2, and then we're going to be back in 1 Timothy but there in 2 Timothy 2, verse 14 says, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the, hear the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat, as doth a canker of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God 
standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So see, it's not, he wants, God wants us to depart from iniquity. God wants us to lead a godly life, but it's not till after we name the name of Christ. So salvation is a very important process, and the works are very important after the salvation. But the thing that, that stands here is, nevertheless, what standeth the foundation of God standeth sure. See, we're, we don't want to stand in the way of sinners. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And the other thing is, you know, I mean, growing up, I wasn't saved till I was 25. You know, you know things of the world, and you know how things work out. And one of the things is, you know, I saw many of my friends, and, and as we were growing up, uh, they partook in things of the world that, you know, I didn't necessarily take on. I'm glad that I didn't partake in more of, of the, the sins of the world so that I didn't have to, you know, I have sin in my life, but I'm glad that I didn't go down certain paths. I'm glad that God was uh, protecting me or he gave me that, uh, he was already giving me that wisdom or drawing me nigh to him. I, I, I searched for God for a long time. So the Bible says, draw nigh to him and he'll draw nigh to you. So I believe that, that there was a, a divine intervention in some of these things, right? But one of the things that's, that's true is, you know, one of the most common things that people like to do is in the college years, they like to drink and go to bars and get drunk and do all that stupid stuff. And well, if that's a great example for this because what's the first thing you got to do to get to the bar? You got to walk into the bar. And then the second thing that people end up doing is when they're drinking, they're just standing around, you know, and, and you say, well, that's kind of a, like a very simple analogy. But it really isn't because the, the matter, the fact of the matter is if you've ever been around anybody who drinks a lot, the one thing they want you to do is they want everybody around them to join. You know, that's their belief system. And as a matter of fact, if you don't drink with people who drink, most of the time they think you're a prune and they think you're kind of weird. And they're like, oh, man, you don't drink. You know, come on, man, just have one drink. One. And what ends up happening is they're telling you their belief system. They're telling you how they think. They're telling you how they act. And the Bible says, look, uh, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, or blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, we shouldn't walk in it. Or standeth in the way of sinners. You're taking a stance in everything in life. As you grow older, you're going to become even more grounded in your beliefs. You know, you, you hear people who uh, get married older and they say, whoa, that's one of the tough things for people as they get older if they're single is that they're set in their ways. You know what they're saying? They're, they're standing for something, that they're grounded in their ways. Well, you know, one of the things that we should do is we should stand for God. We shouldn't stand in the way of sinners, whether it's to impede them from getting to Christ or just hanging around with them and just standing around listening to their stands and not taking our own stance. See, the best way to take our own stance is to walk in the counsel of Christ and then stand with God. Then we won't be standing with the, the ungodly and the sinners. Um, turn there to 1 Timothy just go back uh, a few pages, 1 Timothy 1. You know, what's a sin or what's a sinner? Well, a sin is to depart. It's the transgression of the law. We describe that a lot in our soul winning, right? But, uh, you know, uh, just a, a definition from a dictionary says to depart voluntarily from the path of duty prescribed by God to man. To violate the divine law in any particular uh, by actual transgression or by the neglect or non-observance of its injunctions to violate any known rule of duty, but the reality is God gives us a uh, definition. There's not all sin is equal. You know, there's a, there's different sins. There's even, a, you know, a sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, sin unto death. There's different types of sins that we have in our lives. But the Bible says there, the reason I describe sin is because obviously, what's a sinner? Someone who's transgressing the law. They're in different, they're, they're involved in different types of sin. Now, not all sin is equal, so not all uh uh, punishment or chastisement is equal either but go to there to first timothy 1 9 it says knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners for unholy and profane for murderers of fathers and mother and murders of mothers for manslayers for whoremongers for them to defile themselves with mankind for men stealers for liars for perjured persons and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So, you know, it gives us a list. And then if you notice, some of them are more severe than others. 
It says, in verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant, ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I mean, honestly, if we looked at ourselves uh, and, and we were introspect, we would we at times have felt as we are the chiefest of sinners. And, you know, that's something that we should keep uh, sober and vigilant. We should examine ourselves correctly and know that we are capable of a lot of sin because we are sinners and we're capable of just about anything without the grace of God. Now, that being said, what did he say there? He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all that, that worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So thank God that he came to save sinners, but now that he saved you, don't stand in the way of sinners. You know, stop walking in the counsel of the ungodly. We see all that, right? And then let's go back to Psalm. When he says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So we're still in verse 1. And that third part, it says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Well, you know, if you sit down somewhere, you know, if you're sitting here in the pews today, well, you're not going anywhere. You've made a conscious choice that you walked in here, that you took a stand because you believe that whatever's going to be preached behind this pulpit, you're probably going to agree with if it's from the Word of God, or you believe the doctrines you might not agree with everything 100%, but for the most part, this is why you're sitting here. See, when you go to a concert, or when you go to a bar, or when you go to the movies, or when you go into uh, any establishment of sin, what you're saying is that you are in agreement with that. You say, well, no, but I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Yeah, but you're there. I mean, it's, it is that black and white. You're making that decision. You're consciously saying... This is what, if I don't believe in it, then I'm, I'm not disagreeing with it. You know, that's why we're so hard on certain doctrines. Like, you know, we don't, uh, the reprobate doctrine is, is important to us. We don't uh, partake or have fellowship with the queers or the sodomites. You know, I, Pastor Cobb preached today about how here now, I, I had heard about it in the East Coast, but apparently here in, on Montrose where all the sodomites hang out, uh, at the public library, the, the city mayor and the city attorney have now allowed uh, for these trans uh, sexuals or transvestites or whatever they're called to do uh, reading time in the purpose of influencing people. Look, if I took my children to that event, even if it was just because I said, oh, well, it's free. It, it means no harm. It's just an innocent book. I'm taking a stance. I'm walking in there and I'm sitting approving of this. So we have to make conscious decisions. If I send my kids to the public school system or the public full system and I say, well, it's just because, you know, they're going to get a better education system or the excuse that other people say, like, they're not going to get fellowship with other people or they won't have social skills, whatever the case is, what I'm saying is that I'm okay with whatever they indoctrinate them with, you know, because I'm telling them it's okay to sit in there and accept all that. But let's go there to Luke 14. Go to Luke 14, and then we're going to be in Proverbs 29. Go to Luke 14. Right? Luke 14. And sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. What's scornful? It's someone who's kind of, it's like a disdain and a scoffing and mockery of whatever your belief system is. You know, um, so honestly, you know, going back to that example of these this what this things become popular where these transvestites or trans whatever they are these reprobates that are reading to children you know what they're doing is they're being scornful they're mocking the word of god by saying look we know better and we can educate better and we can indoctrinate better and we can brainwash better you know uh it says in luke 14 25 and there and there went great multitudes with him and he turned and said unto them if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and also his own life, 
he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold, the, behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war, uh, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulted whether he be able to with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while there is, while the other is yet great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he had, he cannot be my disciple. So he's saying, look, you're going to walk, you're going to take a stance, and then you're going to sit down and you're going to count the cost. Well, there's no better way to count the cost than with God's word. You know, and in this example, we can always apply the, uh, you know, uh, another thing. It says, look, you're counting the cost of laying your foundation. Well, look, if you're meditating on the word of God, you know that he has endless riches. It says the king's going to war. Well, we know that Jesus Christ is the king of kings, and there's a war against the devil and his angels and those that he's trying to lead to hell. Well, we've counted the cost. We know that it doesn't take great numbers because greater is he that is in us than he is against us, right? And so the thing that we need to do is we need to be conscious of the decisions that we're making. You know, what's that word scornful mean? It means something contemptuous, disdainful, entertaining, score, insolent, acting in defiance or disregard. You know, you're holding in contempt. And I, and I know I, I told you earlier, but I'm just kind of giving you another definition here. Go to Proverbs 29, and we're going to be there in verse 6. Proverbs 29, and then I'll also read for you Isaiah, but stay in Proverbs. Let's just stay in Proverbs. But uh, Proverbs 29 says, In the transgression, verse 6, In the transgression of an evil man there is a snare, but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. Scornful men bring a city to bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. If a if a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. That's why we are soul winners. Not just that verse, many verses, but that's a very good verse as to why we're soul winners. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth, keepeth it in till afterwards. You know, so we're talking about, uh, you know, God's giving us these, these uh, uh, contrasts. And in there we see in verse 8 that the scornful men bring a city into a snare, but the wise man turn away th wrath. You know, God's going to be, uh, bless us, but we have to do the certain conditions that he's given us. Turn back to Proverbs 1 while I read for you Isaiah 28 on a scornful, staying on the subject of scornful. It says, uh, Where, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that, the rule, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Isaiah 28, 14. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we made, for we have made lies our refuge, and understood falsehood have we hid ourselves, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, that he that believeth shall not make haste. And so we see here that, the, that it's a progression, right? It, once you get to the scornful, what they're saying, who, what did the scornful do here? Well, they made an agreement. They made a covenant. They made a, a covenant with death. So it's a blood covenant, but it's a, a death covenant, you know, for all eternity. And with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through. See, the, the progression is either going to be one way or the other. Now, I'm talking to... Those that are saved, you know, those that have accepted Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us very clear that salvation is by grace. It's by faith alone. All we have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to just call upon his name and we're saved for all eternity. But look, that's not enough, in my opinion, for growth, for change in the world. 
You know, we're going to lead. I mean, every day, there's soul winners out here in, in, in this country, and every day we're leading people to Christ, and every day. But how many of those people are coming to church? I don't know. Maybe not a lot. And then the, the challenge is that if they continue in their sin, then we're not uh, expanding the kingdom through those individuals. You, do you see what I mean? It's not that, because uh, I, I want to make it clear, I'm not advocating for work salvation. It's saved by grace through Jesus Christ. But there is something to be said about once you're saved, you should walk uprightly. You should walk in the counsel of God. You should stand, not in the way of the sinner. You should not sit, right, in the seat of the scornful. Don't partake in the world anymore. The Bible says if you're a friend of the world, you're at enmity with God. You know, don't continue to be against God. Don't continue to be a stumbling block. Be with God and the things of God and delight in his word. So let's go, let's go back to Psalm 1. I mean, you might as well just keep your finger there. Verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. What does delight mean? Well, delight means, you know, a high degree of pleasure or satisfaction. You know, I delight in certain things in life. There's certain things that I really enjoy. They give you great pleasure. You know, when... Uh, with my little ones do something that, that they've been trying for a while. You know, the first time my daughter walked, it was, I delighted in the fact that she now has taken a new step in independence, that we're getting closer to a different stage in life. Uh, you know, the day that I got married to my wife, I delighted in the fact that, you know, now I'm married to the woman that I love for all eternity. I mean, for, for the rest of my life, I am, I'm delightful at certain things. I delight when I come to church and I hear a good sermon and, you know, the word of, of God is preached hard and it, uh, you know, it strengthens me and it sharpens me and it makes my countenance uh, more sure for Christ. Go to Proverbs 1, verse 22. What does the Bible say about delight? Well, there's two ways to look at it, right? Uh, in verse 22 of Proverbs 1, it says, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight. So see, it's not just... Delight, you can take pleasure in the sins of the world. It says, in the scorners delight in their scorning. And fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have said at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. It will be too late. For, they, uh, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would, not, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. For whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Is that consistent with, uh, you know, verse 2? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he meditate day and night? Of course. He delights, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, the spiritual man. See, there's a delight of the scorner that leads to hell and destruction, or there's the delight in the word of, the God, in the word of God. Uh, go to Luke 21, I'm going to read for you Romans 7, 23. It says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the, the mind, I am myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Go to uh, Luke 21. When we delight, we take pleasure. We're going to meditate. We're going to uh, uh, partake in, in the meat, in, in, the, in the fruit of the word. Go to Luke 21, verse 10. The Bible says, Then said he unto them, Nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. 
But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being bought, uh, brought before the kings and rulers for my namesake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. You know why I believe he says that here? Because if we meditate on God's word, then the answer will come from God. It says, For I will give you a mouth and a wisdom which all your adversaries should not be able to uh, gainsay or resist. See, if we meditate on the word of the Lord, then he's going to provide the words and you shall be both betrayed uh, and you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends and some of you shall say they cause to be uh, and and some of you shall they cause to be put to death and you shall be hated of all men's sake of all men for my sake but there shall not a hair of your head perish in your patience possess ye your souls the first timothy 4 6 or actually turn there to first timothy 4 verse 6 and then we'll close out with the rest of psalms and we'll tie this all together. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 6, it says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Now this is talking about a preacher, you know, because at the end of the day, if you've taken the call or you've taken the, the urge or the, the, you feel the need to, to stand in the gap, if you've done these things, then there's, a, there's even more required of you. There's more expected of you. It says in verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' tales, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, why am I using this also in general? Because this is something that we can apply to anybody. Uh, specifically, though, we're held to a higher standard, right? It says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that is now and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. So these are the things that we are to command and teach. Psalms 1, uh, you know, I just read in Proverbs about how God will laugh at your calamity. Uh, basically all the statutes, everything. It says, these things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example of believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Well, how do you do that? You walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, right? You stand not in the way of sinners, and you sit not in the sit of the scornful. Till I come, here's the key, give attendance to reading, meditating, or delighting on the word of the God, to exhortation, preaching it, to doctrine, to the truth. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. It's important for us to walk correctly, to stand correctly and to sit correctly right because it, people that are listening to us you're going to lead them to christ and the reason that i preach that final part is because you can apply that to those who are preaching the word of god door to door when you're a soul winner you can give attendance to reading exhortation and doctrine right you can do that now of course right there it says neglect not the gift that is in thee which is given by prophecy with the laying of the hands of the presbytery. Now, when someone lays a hand on you, it's talking to the preacher, but that doesn't neglect the fact that some of the rules apply to just everybody. You, everybody should read their Bible. Everybody should exhort the brethren and those that aren't uh, of the household of God. And everybody should preach correct doctrine. And if you don't know doctrine, then learn it. How do you do that? By reading. By going to someone where they're preaching the Word of God and they're exhorting the Word of God and they're reproving and rebuking and teaching the whole counsel of God. Let's go to verse 3 and let's just close out. He said, verse 3 of Psalm 1 says, And he shall be plant, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And I love that verse because it's in his season. See, sometimes we try to rush the timing of God. Look, your requirement is to just follow God. To walk with God, to sit with God, to stand with God. In, his, in your season, the season that God has set for you, you'll bring the fruit. 
His leave also should not wither, and the wind dry up, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And if you've ever seen that, I actually looked up several videos, you know, where they're either hitting the threshing floor and removing the chaff that way, or they're literally, you know, taking uh, rakes and throwing the, the wheat up so that the wind will take the chaff away. Is Why does the chaff go away? Because it's light. It has it's weak doctrine. It's false. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't stand on anything. It doesn't take a side. It doesn't walk with anything. It won't sit down and count the, count, count, count the cost. All it is, is just fluff. But, but the wheat stays because it's, it's the meat. It's the nourishment. That's what you want to get. You know, let's go to verse uh, uh, 5. It says, Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Well, how do you, what's the righteous? Those that are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. And don't we use that verse a lot, John 4, 14, 6? Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Lord knoweth the way of righteousness, of righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. See, there's only two roads. Now people say, oh, there's many roads. Well, no, it's really, you know, if you're looking at your life, there's a fork in the road at some point that you have to come to make a decision. This one, that's just one narrow road. And then this one's really confusing because it's one road, but then it spawns off into branches. And each one of these branches keeps telling you that that's the way, that this is the way, that you can do it like this, and you can do it like that. All of these roads are just, they're just leading to destruction and hell. It says, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so the thing that I really, I mean, this is, this packs a punch. Now, honestly, we could probably preach on every one of these words individually and just have a whole set of sermons. We could probably do a whole series just on Psalm 1 and how we shouldn't partake in certain sins and how we shouldn't do certain things, how we shouldn't listen to certain people. But, you know, I hope that this message was as helpful to you as it was to me. And I know it was a lot of, doc, I mean, a, a lot of verses and a lot of doctrine, but this just, it's important for us as we begin the years, as we begin any new task, that we examine ourselves and we say, okay, are we walking in the counsel of Christ? Are we standing in the way of, of his message so that we're not standing in the way of sinners? Or, and are we sitting? What seat are we sitting in? The word of the Lord? Or are we opening up, you know, our magazines and our TVs and our internet, and then neglecting the Word of God. You know, when you sit down to do something, what is it that you're sitting down to do? So, you know, in closing, read Psalm 1 as much as you have, memorize it, hide it in your heart so that you know the way of righteousness. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach a message like this. Um, you know, sometimes th these messages just require, you know, a lot of, uh, of your word to just back it up and show the consistency of you know what you preach and what you exhort and what you uh, lay upon us lord and i just pray that as we continue in uh, 2019 and for the rest of our lives that we seek your counsel lord that we uh don't stand in the way of sinners but instead preach the gospel of jesus christ and that we don't even sit in the seat of the scornful that we we don't get around people who are disdainful to your word, who mock your word, who hate you. We know the consequences of them, but let us be upright. Let us be righteous. Let us be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, with the, uh, with the fruit of righteousness, so that we can go out there and do more for you uh, every day instead of what we've done in the past for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.